hi everybody. Thank you for showing up on, uh, you know, our, the last day of week three. Um, so uh, as I mentioned yesterday in Slack, um, one thing I've noticed throughout the week um, through just, you know, the conversations and presentations um, we've been going through uh, is that um, it seems that there, uh, while you guys were, you know, taught a lot about Python, a lot about these different tools, one thing that we may have um, overlooked in some of the earlier weeks is teaching you guys about scripting. And an important reason why this is an oversight, as opposed to just something that's like a, you know, an auxiliary skill, is that both mine and Valerie's lessons actually depend on knowing this. Um, so for instance, like making packages, writing tests for your code. Um, these things are exceptionally difficult to do for notebooks. Um, and or just borderline impossible. Um, so really what I'm going to be kind of doing is I'll, I'm going to share a fun slide deck with you guys. Um, again, this was, uh, I mentioned this just a few ago to those who are already on the call. Um, this is a talk made by a guy named Joel Grass. He's a very well-known data scientist. He literally wrote a book on data science, um, at least one, I think maybe a couple now. And he gave this talk at a Jupyter convention about how he doesn't like notebooks. And um, this echoes a lot of the same kind of sentiments that I have about them. And that's not to say they're a useless tool. And again, I want to very clearly say that they are very useful for a lot of good reasons. Um, and in particular, like, they're a, a terrific sandbox for be, like, interactive development of code, for making visualizations and these types of things. But where I think the, the line is, is when it comes to trying to scale up your code and, you know, run it on a supercomputer, run it on a cluster, um, you know, process all your data, things like that. Things that aren't meant to be interactive by nature. You know, if you create a processing pipeline, you're not supposed to be interacting with every single step of that. Um, the goal is to have your pipeline written, to put your data into it, to let it run, let it do its thing for several hours, maybe, or, or days, depending on the pipeline come back at the end and look at, you know, quality control statistics and, and figures um, summarizing your, your results. Notebooks are, you know, would actually make that type of workflow impossible because you'd, you know, have web browser issues where like your web browser times out, your internet connection gets delayed and then all of a sudden your kernel crashes um, and all that kind of stuff where it's just, it's not the right tool for the job. So um, there's, a, again, just to, uh, rephrase something I said earlier and because of the nature of the way notebooks are structured you actually can't even really write tests for them um, you know you can accidentally do things like uh, import well not even accidentally for some reason you can do things like import the state of one notebook into another which makes it really unclear what's happening um, by the way there's so many great gifs in here I'm gonna I'm not gonna go through the whole slide deck but I very much encourage you guys to I'll post in the content channel after this um, but, uh, but because of this, because notebooks are, you know, these interactive environments, not autonomous self-contained scripts, um, they actually get in the way of creating reproducible and extensible workflows because you can't just, you know, download someone's notebook and all of a sudden up apply it on your own data. You'd need to interact with it. You'd need to, you know, find the specific lines that are, you know, loading their data set or whatever. Um, but also it makes it impossible to test because again, you can't just like, I want to run cell 73. I want to run cell 15. And you know, then I want to run the combination of those two without any in the middle. Like that's just not possible in the structure of notebooks. Um, so again, they are a great tool and I, I do use them regularly in particular for visualization. Um, but this is mostly just to get um, to com communicate the way that you should actually be developing if you're worried about making like data processing pipelines. Um, does anyone have any questions kind of right off the bat in terms of, um, you know, where I'm coming from or, or what I mean? I'll open the chat window if I can find it. There we go. Found it much e more easily this time. I'll give you guys a few seconds to type. Or of course, you know, you can unmute yourselves. I'm not that scary. Cool. Um, so the example that, uh, that motivated this today um, was uh, yesterday I was meeting with uh, one, of my, uh, one of the project teams that I've been hanging out with all week, um, Danielle and Ashraf, and they had some scripts and they were again wondering how we can, you know, how can we put these on Compute Canada? How can we process a bunch of different models and compute a bunch of different features and do this all, you know, on all of my data at once and try a bunch of different combinations? And they had these notebooks. 
And so I said, okay, well, we should probably put them in a script. And they said, well, Greg, what the hell? No one taught us how to do that. Let's do that. Um, so what they did was they put stuff into a notebook for me and I'm literally going to go through this notebook and I'm probably going to write less than 10 lines of code myself. Um, all I'm going to do is essentially take this notebook that probably looks very similar to a lot of the notebooks you guys have all written. Um, and I'm just going to refactor it in such a way that it becomes a script and something that you could deploy without interaction um, that could actually be testable, that could be extensible. Um, and, you know, uh, then you guys can hopefully uh, learn from this and I'll push it back to the project and again, share a link to the, to the starting and end like product um, in the content channel. So everyone can, can kind of see and see if they need to, or if they can emulate this themselves. So again, if anyone has any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to interrupt uh, throughout or, or what have you. Um, yeah. So, um, so to move forward, um, I forked the repository that they gave me just so I can make changes, push the new script, and I'll send it back to them. Um, so, you know, I, I cloned it locally. I have this, uh, this, um, ah, this uh, Greg demo IPython notebooks uh, file. But I'm just pretty much going to be going back and forth between the version on the browser um, just because it's easy to see. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create Greg demo script.py. Okay, so actually, I'm not sure if you can see, I'm moving the zoom control so it's not blocking the top of my screen. I don't know if they were visible on your screen, but I couldn't see the top line. Um, cool. So the first thing that I'm typing is whatever I just typed on line one. Hopefully you can all see it. It's um, pound exclamation point slash user slash bin slash n space Python. Does anyone know what this is called? You can say no, just so I get some amount of interaction. Perfect, thank you, um, Savania. Uh, so uh, this is called a shebang. And you maybe have seen at the top of like bash scripts, you maybe have seen something like um, user um, bin bash or something like that. Um, yep, so Kendra got it exactly right. Um, yeah, something with a bang. Yeah, so it's literally called a shebang, as Ken, um, almost exactly as uh, Kendra put it in the chat. It's, uh, yeah. So um, there's probably some origin story to the name. It doesn't really matter. It's, that's what it's called. Um, but basically, the reason what, or what this line does at the top of your script is it tells the terminal, the whatever is executing your script, um, how to execute it. Basically what it's saying in this case is to execute this using whatever Python environment is currently set up for your user. Um, this in general, if you're calling a script saying um, with uh, the, a line like the following, um, then the shebang doesn't matter. Um, but if what you're trying to do instead is something like my script without the Python in front of it. So again, the same way you'd execute like a bash script, um, then the shebang does matter. Um, so again, the reason I would just say always put it, um, there we go, I'm just sorry, I'm trying to type and uh, write at the same time. So I would always recommend putting one just because it doesn't hurt anything. And again, it can give you a little more flexibility in how you call your program. So first things first, at the top of your file, the same way we have here, we import our libraries. So I'm just going to paste all these guys um, for the sake of um, me being uh, nitpicky. I'm going to remove, there's a duplicate import here. SciPy IO is imported twice. Um, I'm also, in general, there's some standards in terms of how you're supposed to import things, um, like what order to do them in and things like that. Um, what I often do is I sort them based on, just because I'm a little OCD, uh, by the length of the line. <laughs> and I use the froms uh, above and all the stuff. And this is really just because it makes it easier to, um, to read. 
again, this is no particular reason. Yeah, I see the question. I just haven't read it yet. Um, so if you want to use a virtual env, do you need to put the path of the virtual env? No, actually. So, um, so what, uh, by putting env here in the shebang, thank you for asking, Frederick that's, and Francois. Um, th those are great questions. So if you're writing a Python script, this, what I have on line one is always exactly what you should put. Um, if, for instance, you always wanted to use the system default Python, you would do user bin Python. By putting user bin env Python, it is saying, look in your current environment. There's a variable that you have, or a command that you could type in your bash terminal, env, and it would show you all of the variables that are instantiated for your terminal. Um, what it would then say is, look for the one that we're calling Python, and it'll be the path to whatever your default Python is in that environment. What this means is, if you are in a virtual environment, say a Conda environment or one by virtual env, um, it will point to that version of Python. So if you have this be your shebang, it will always point to whatever version you are intending to use based on the environment you're in outside of the script. If you do this, it will always use the system default. This will also use the system default if you're not in a virtual environment. So basically, again, this is always the right thing to do. Um, because in the case where you're not in a virtual environment, it'll use the same thing as this. And in the case where you are, it'll also do what you actually intend, not, um, not sneakily uh, use the default version. Um, let me know if that was unclear, but you don't need to know much more other than this is always the shebang you should use. Um, cool. So, uh, so again, in terms of the uh, libraries, I generally organize them as the froms above because the lines are generally longer and then just in order based on trying to group things from the package they come from um, and things like that, just to make it a little easier. Um, I'm also going to add one up here. Um, par I can't spell, parser. Okay, well, I'm breaking my ordering by line length, so I'm gonna put that there. Again, you, that is not at all important. That is not necessary. Um, <laughs> the ordering based on line length, that is just a Greg OCDism. Um, so, uh, cool. So then what I'm going to do is start worrying about the script. Or I'll actually scroll through the notebook again just to make sure they aren't importing things anywhere else. Uh, no, we look like we're good. Cool. Um, Oh, by the way, first, actually, I'd quickly like to interrupt myself and just say thank you, Daniel, uh, Danielle and Ashraf for sharing this. I know it's like a little nerve wracking to have your code on display for other humans. Um, you're awesome. I appreciate you being willing to let me sandbox on your on your notebook. So thank you. Um, but anyways, back to this. Um, cool. So, uh, so the next thing I'm going to add is if name equals name. Does anyone, has anyone seen this before? Again, you can write yes or no in the chat and I'll just get a sense for a distribution based on whoever responds. Who has seen this thing before? Okay. Yes, but I never understood it is exactly the answer I expected. Um, so, uh, and no is also, um, <laughs> so basically one thing that's interesting is that Python as you know, what you, here I'll open a second terminal. Um, if you are in a terminal, there are a bunch of, you know, you can do dir and see a bunch of different variables that are created as soon as you open your Python shell, including name. What is name? Main. So what, let's see, what maybe packages? Let's look at that one. Nothing. So what this is essentially saying is my current terminal is, is running with the name main, and it's not part of any package. Um, what the name variable essentially means is how is this being called? Is this the main program being executed, or is it being called by another program? And that's really what it comes down to. So the, if name is main, then run, I'm going to say, this function called main. Um, what this essentially is saying is um, I can have a bunch of functions here and, um, and I can import them using like, you know, creating a, a package or um, a library or, or whatever, similarly to how um, Valerie was showing you yesterday. 
And then I can, you know, import my script and say, I want to use function one, I want to use function two. But only if I'm calling this as a script, only if I'm calling this as the main workflow, will I go through and I will process things in order using this function. So this is an, an, maybe a more useful name that we can give this function is a driver. It is our driving script. It is basically saying, I want to run my whole script if I'm being called um, as the main program. So again, this is the type of thing that if you don't, if you didn't put this, if you just started, you know, having your main script, um, details could go here. Um, if you just started putting these details here, that would also run when you're running it as a script. But the reason you don't want to do that is because then you couldn't import this library without automatically running it. Because again, when you're running, when you're, sorry, when you're importing code, when you're creating a package, what it's essentially doing is going through your entire script and running every line of code. If you're creating functions, that's fine. Um, but if you're calling functions, then it would try and perform them. So again, the reason why we do this, if name main, then you run a driving script as opposed to putting our, um, our driver script just at the top level, is we're saying only do our driver if we're calling it, not importing it. Um, again, if that's unclear, please let me know in, in the comments. Okay, so what I'm going to do um, is I'm going to create um, argument parser. Um, and I'm going to explain this in a second description. Okay. So this is a library that you guys saw me import above. I can actually close this guy now. Um, this is a library you saw me import above right up here on line, uh, on line 12. And, uh, and what essentially it is, is it allows you to provide arguments to your script the same way that you saw me do with the uh, example I provided on when, Tuesday, Wednesday, whenever I taught. Um, and uh, and this, is a, this is a way that you can provide or both enable user interaction, but have it be done like kind of before running your script as opposed to throughout. So I'm gonna create an argument parser. So first of all, I put this thing called file. Um, so file, underscore, underscore file, the same way that we have a name variable that's created when our script gets run, you know, that says, am I being the, am I the main driver script or am I not? Um, file is simply the path to your file. So the argument parser will just include the name of the file in it so that it can provide more detailed like help text. And the description will be, um, I'm just gonna put the name of the repo, uh, emotions project BHS 2020. Um, and that seems like a fine description for now. Cool. So that's all I'm going to do right now for the parser. And now we kind of have the, oh, and I'll delete these dummy functions I made just as illustrations. Um, so now we kind of have the basic scaffolding. We have our libraries. We have, we know that we're not going to run our script unless we're calling it as the main, uh, as the main intended use. We're not like going to run all our functions if we're just trying to import them. And we kind of have a very basic stub of that driving script. So what I'm going to do now is commit it because I, you know, I know you guys have all been introduced to GitHub and I just want to um, exemplify good practices. Um, again, I mentioned before, I have annoying shorthands for everything. So GST is git status, um, GA is git add. Um, I'll try and remember to type them out just so you don't get confused and think like GA is a command. It isn't. Um, get status, so then that's added. Git commit dash, or I guess am is, whoops, one too many ms. Um, initial script stub, git push. Perfect. Now let's go back to the script. Okay, so the next thing I'm going to do now that we have our little notebook is I'm going to start copying over functions. So let's go to this cell here. We got a function here. Um, by the way, can you guys just, uh, again, sound off in the chat. Has anyone or, uh, taught you about code style yet? Again, pie code style, flake eight, maybe, if, maybe a term that was used. No, okay, cool. Awesome. So that's a thing that I'm also going to mention in a second then. I'm just gonna paste a couple more functions first, if you don't mind. Whoops, I almost forgot the first line. 
And again, if ever things are going too fast or slow, please, you know, stop me. Um, the uh, purpose of this is really as like an ad hoc meant to be immediately like applicable, actionable type of lesson. It's not really um, uh, anything other than that. So please do stop me if it's not as useful as you want or I'm missing details. Um, cool, well, we'll start with these three functions and then we'll go from there in a second. Cool, so I pasted them. You may notice that in my terminal, it highlighted a bunch of stuff, some funny colors. Does anyone know why that happened or can anyone make a guess? Too long, that is exactly right. Um, there's another cause as well, which is if there are uh, white spaces at the end of lines without any content after them. Um, so this is just a configuration that I set up for my text editor. Um, and the main reason that I you know, do this is uh, because simply it's easier to read short lines. There's also a bunch of other conventions. So for instance, how, uh, how much to indent is another one. So for instance, um, you know, four characters is a pretty standard indent. It looks like right here we have um, a double indent where maybe we didn't need one. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so there's essentially things that are called style guides that, where is the end of this block? Here we go. There are things that are, are called style guides. The main one for Python is called PEP8. Um, PEP8 is the name of the main Python uh, style. And it, it requires a bunch of things. So pretty much I have my text editor set up to mostly show me problems that will emerge when I'm trying to make my code compatible with the style guide. And again, the, main, the only reason is to increase readability, both of yourself, uh, sorry, like by yourself and other people. So I'm not gonna obsess over making, um, I did set this up manually for my editor, but you can also like, if you're using Visual Studio Code, um, they have plugins that you can like, or extensions, whatever they're called in VS Code, uh, that, um, that can do it for you. That can say, you know, style, uh, style check my code all the time. Um, there's also like, I think the Python extension will automatically, it's also called linting by the way, uh, checking and fixing style. Um, so I think the Python extension for VS Code will automatically run a linter if you have one installed every time you hit save. Um, there's also um, like a Python library called Black that will do it for you. And there's a way to configure it in GitHub so that every time you do a push, it'll reformat your code. Yeah. Um, and there's also ways to, like every, as uh, when I was showing you guys testing and continuous integration earlier in the week, um, it's a part of every one of my testing workflows. After I run all my real tests, the last test is running like a Python code style checker on my software so that the tests will fail if it isn't passing all of the style guidelines. Um, and so at the beginning, when you're not familiar with the style guidelines, it can be a bit of a pain in the ass um, because, well, you don't, no, you know, it's irrelevant details you're changing all the time. You know, this doesn't change how my code actually runs. Um, but then you just kind of get used to it. And, uh, and then you just end up writing code that's compliant with that style. So, I mean, I think, I can't think of the last time that I had to actually, you know, make considerable changes um, according to the style guide. Because again, if you set up your editor to help um, and you just get used to it, it's, it becomes very easy. Um, yeah, the Isabella is being recorded. Uh, yeah. So there, this will be online like the rest of them, I believe. Thank you to Valerie for that. Um, so uh, yeah, so anyways, I copy pasted the functions. We'll go through, again, I won't worry too much about line length. I can do it for simple things like, you know, comments um, because those are easy to fix, but I won't worry about it for everything else. Just get a little bit of the yellow gone, okay? Um, there's also things like in style guides that my thing, my editor doesn't highlight, like you want spaces after commas and a bunch of other random crap that again, it's, you'll get used to it. It doesn't really matter right now. So let's see, pasted a couple, pasted a couple functions. Those also look fine. Just making sure mostly right now that the indentation was preserved because I didn't want to, you know, actually break the function of the, of the code. Um, so I'm just gonna copy, those all look fine to me. So I'm gonna copy the remaining functions. Are there any? Um, the last one I extracted was feature extraction EEG. Oh, there's one more. Oh, I should have just done the last one before then. Um, okay. 
And uh, another thing that you notice actually that I do is there's a, another piece of the style guide is just that you can have like one line uh, separation within a, within a function, but between functions, you always have two. And this again, just makes it easier to distinguish what's one block of code from another block of code. Um, so that's another thing. It's just, again, like such a tiny detail, but just makes your life a little easier when you're reading it. Cool. So we have all these functions. Um, what I'm going to do is commit again. Get commit dash am. So all of the files that I've modified, the m is the message. Um, I'm going to say added functions not yet script. Um, So now what I'm going to quickly do, I'm actually going to turn on a virtual environment. Um, I don't want that one. I have one, I have a virtual environment that I use that's just like general purpose and it's a general purpose Python three environment. Um, so I call it GP three. You can do this, whatever environment you want. Again, that's just like, so you're not wondering what, what the hell is GP three, Greg? You didn't explain this to us. That's just the name of an environment I use for everything um, that I don't care about particular dependencies for or need to be careful. In. Um, but I use it, it over using my base version, like without using a virtual environment, simply because I don't want clutter in my main version of Python that's used everywhere else. I don't want to accidentally break things from my main system. So I think the only library that I don't have here is NeuroKit 2. The rest should be there. So just installing that guy. Again, feel free to ask questions, especially now that we're currently in a waiting period. Perfect. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is say Python Greg demo script up high. What's happening? And again, if this is if the font is too small or anything, um, please uh, just tell me and I'll embiggen it. Ooh, module not found. TK inter. Oh, that's a matplotlib thing. Um, yeah, this is my, uh, I will Google this error. This is uh, an annoying matplotlibism. They changed things recently. Um, there's a way to avoid it. I just forget it. So Google is your best friend. Um, again, as you noticed in my last uh, tutorial as well, the amount of things that I actually remember um, is very small. I am just obsessed with Googling. That's not what I wanted. I don't want to install it. I just want to avoid the problem. Um, does downloading all these packages take up considerable space in your local environment? Is that another benefit? Um, so they take up the same amount of space, whether they're in my main environment or in a virtual environment, that's not the issue. Um, code is also very small. I mean, if you think about it, like this is a text file, right? So like if you, we, we look at, um, if we look at this file, you know, all of what we put in there is five and a half kilobytes. Um, you know, pictures are much bigger as an example. So installing different libraries generally isn't a huge issue. Um, it's mostly just so that when I'm trying to, again, like import one version of a script or another, I just won't have version conflicts because I won't have a lot of random things installed on my system. Um, David, great question. Why did you install VNV instead of Conda? Um, uh, here's the line I wanted. Um, well, I never use Conda. Um, I realize that I'm making a lot of decisions that are unpopular compared to the, uh, what the instructors earlier in the class probably told, told you to do. Um, <laughs> and the main reason being is that I think um, Conda serves a very, uh, kind of um, unique use case of when installation is tough, but like manageable without containers. It's kind of this in-between step is almost when I would use it is if I can't just pip install something, but I don't want to go all the way to containers. And there's sometimes there's this middle ground. So for instance, there's a library called VTK that's used for, um, that's used a lot for uh, visualization of like three-dimensional graphics. So for instance, uh, anyone who's doing diffusion processing, visualizing fibers all used to happen in VTK. It was a big pain actually because VTK was so hard to install consistently across systems. And Conda was great because Conda had a, a 
well, like robust installed version of VTK that you could get. Um, and that way you didn't have to go all the way to virtual machines. You didn't have to go to containers, um, but pip also wouldn't do the job. So Conda was like perfect for that niche use case. In general, most things don't require Conda. Um, I mean, I have, I've literally used Conda once and it was for teaching because other instructors that I was following had used Conda. Um, so that just goes to show that, you know, I do, I develop a lot of Python. It's not a necessary tool. It's really a, ma a matter of finding a workflow that works for you. Um, if you prefer the interface of Conda, the workflow, that is wonderful. Um, you know, don't let me stand in your way. Um, if you feel like it's not, you know, it's more clunky than you want, try using pip and see how far that gets you. Um, again, in the answer for most of these things is do whatever is easy um, for you to do well, basically. You know, notebooks are great and all that stuff. Again, the reason why I'm saying scripting over notebooks in this particular use case is the piece that it's hard to do well with writing scripts is testing. Or sorry, with notebooks is testing. And we want to test our scripts. We want to make sure our workflows are really robust. Um, so again, I, I would think it, as a rule of thumb, just try and think, what is the easiest way for me to do this task well? Use that tool. Does that answer your question in a very, very verbose way? Cool. All right. So I'm going to now rerun my little script. Uh, let's see if this solves my TK inter problem. Awesome. N nothing happened. Does anyone know why nothing happened? Um, no, it, I don't think Conda, uh, Melissa's question was, is Conda a more modern replacement for PIP? Um, no, Conda isn't uh, a more modern replacement. I mean, it definitely has different features and is bigger. Um, but I mean, PIP is literally just crawls the website, PyPy, and downloads packages for you. Like there isn't really technological like advancement that needs to happen. Um, so no, Conda just, it is, it adds a lot of features, adds a lot of bells and whistles that again on some systems, like I think on Windows in particular, Conda is a huge advantage um, because it makes it a lot easier to install things that are otherwise complicated to install. But if you're on Mac, if you're on Linux, um, the advantages become a lot less. It's just another tool. Um, but no, it's not like it's the upgrade of PIP or anything like that. Um, cool. So nothing happened because main doesn't do much yet. There's no output because the script, so nothing should be printed, or no function call. So these are all basically, if you average all of those answers, that is exactly right. Um, but no, David's, I think, is, is perfect. It's because main doesn't do much yet. So let's just make sure that main was being called. Um, I think I actually called it driver, but yeah. Um, print, hello. Okay, now let's just make sure that that was actually being called. So we should see something get printed. Yay, look, we got output, wonderful. So basically what happened is, as, if, as you know, some of the comments said, our, our functions are being defined but they weren't being called yet, so nothing happened. Again, in our driver script, which was being called, as evidenced by the hello we just saw on our screen, um, doesn't really do anything. We created a parser, but we didn't use it. We didn't ask it to get inputs for us or anything like that. We just have it there. So, um, so yeah, we weren't basically asking the script to do anything. So now what we wanna do is add the script-like pieces. Um, cool. So I'm going to basically go through the cells in from top to bottom because that's kind of the order that they would be run in the script and paste them in here. And then as we're going, or after I've done all this, we're gonna kind of go through them and see which ones we may wanna tweak um, to make it a little more interactive for us. Okay, so one thing to also note is um, if you're running a line like this, like line 136, um, in, uh, in a notebook, you may have noticed if this is the last line in your cell, the output will be printed for you. If it's not the last line in your cell, you're doing something after it, it won't. That's because it, you're working in a terminal. It's basically only gonna print one output stream for you. Um, if you really want this printed all the time, you could wrap it in a print command, but I think we probably don't even necessarily 
care if it's printed. I'm just going to put that there for the sake of it being a placeholder. But, um, but again, in the case of a notebook, that would be printed. In the case of an actual script, it wouldn't be. Uh, do same thing here. Uh, here. Whoops, one too many indents. Um, okay. Uh, can go here. Yep, yeah, yeah, yeah. By the way, you should, um, if anyone's curious as to what this script does, you should um, poke uh, Danielle and Ashraf later um, because their project's really cool. It's about working with um, ECG and, um, and EEG data and trying to like, I don't know, I'm gonna butcher the explanation, trying to basically predict um, physiological responses to stimuli like different movies or things like that. Um, it's pretty awesome. And then all of this stuff. And I think this is our second to last cell. It is, look at that, we're getting so close to finished. Cool, okay. This one's a bit messier. I'm just gonna indent it all. That should work, cool. And again, in case anyone's wondering the text editor I'm using, it's Vim. Um, I would not recommend any of you start using Vim. Uh, it takes a long time to learn how to use. And when I started using it, Visual Studio Code didn't really exist. Um, so it was kind of the best thing for me at the time. But you have Visual Studio Code, so save yourselves. Cool. And then so the last thing here, wonderful. And I think I also want to indent all of this. Um, where did my mouse go? Here we are. Uh, could you share my VimRC? I can. I will share that for you um, after the, the class. If you, um, if you could message me on Slack in case I forget, that would be helpful. Okay. I, I can also share, by the way, um, as some of you may have noticed, I have some nice like configuration for my bash terminal. Like it'll show what virtual environment I'm in. Um, it'll show what branch I'm on in a GitHub repository. If it's this color, it means that the branch is dirty, meaning I have to commit things. If it's blue, it means the branch is clean, um, all that kind of stuff. So if you also want, I can share, um, again, just someone message me if this is the case. Um, I can share the configuration that gives me this pretty little setup too. Let's see. Cool. So we have copy pasted all of our things. Um, so now in theory, what would happen is if I were to run the script end to end, so I'm not going to run it because I don't have their data files on my computer. Um, but, uh, but if I were to run the script end to end, it would run all of these function calls. This would work because the functions defined above it, so on and so forth. But the main limitation of this is that all of the data pads are hard coded. They're, we're expecting the data to be in the same place. And this is where, you know, having code in a notebook isn't extensible because you can't just give this notebook to someone else and expect them to be able to say like, go, and it'll work on their data set. Even if they have the exact same files, they need to be in the exact same places relative to the script as it was for your computer in order for these things to work. So this is why I created an argument parser. So this is essentially where we can take all of, we can now scroll through all of these different details in our script, see the pieces where we're actually getting inputs um, from, our, uh, from our users and uh, you know, create specific arguments for them so they can be explicitly provided and, uh, and the script should run on the data wherever it happens to live. So I'm gonna do parser.add argument. Um, and by the way, there are many different libraries also for argument parsing. There's one called docopt, where you basically write like, basically documentation, like a comment string of how you want the parser to work and it'll be interpreted. Um, there's, uh, what, what's the one I'm thinking of right now? I think there's one called click that you basically put, um, I'm not sure if you guys have learned about decorators, um, but you basically put like, um, 
certain annotations above functions and then you create a parser for each function, which is super cool. Um, again, I am a little old school and use argument parser, which is the one that comes default in Python. It doesn't require installing anything. Um, and it's the one I like, um, but again, you know, it's an argument parser. Its job is to just make it easy for you to define what inputs people should provide and for them to do that. Um, so kind of, it's a matter of picking your poison really. Um, again, there's a bunch of links about which ones you should use and, and all that stuff. It, again, whatever you think is the easiest way for you to do the job well. Okay, so let's see, I'm going to, I can't spell dreamer mat file is going to be our first input. Um, I'm going to make sure that we store it and I'm going to create some help text around this. Um, so what we're going to say is, you know, um, path to, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know what this file particularly is, so we'll have to wait for Danielle and Ashraf to um, update the description here to be more useful. Um, path to dreamer, um, mat file, i.e. dreamer dot mat. And that seems fine for now. Um, basically contains all the raw data. Cool, thank you. Uh, whoops, uh, wrong command. Raw data mat file, that seems fine. Um, so then one, one thing I'm gonna do first before I add other arguments uh, is I'm gonna say results equals parser dot parse arts. Okay. So what this line is essentially saying, where before what my script was gonna do is it was just gonna run through, and again, we saw it made it past the parser without doing anything, and it printed our hello. Um, what, uh, what this parse args function is going to do is basically say, you cannot get past me, you cannot get past this line, unless you provide the arguments I asked for. So in this case, where if I didn't pass the, if I ran the script and I didn't pass um, uh, an argument, uh, and I just kind of, this line wasn't here, it would still try and run through the whole script. It would still try and do everything. Um, whereas again, what this line imposes is that you are not allowed to do anything unless you provide me the arguments I need. And then we can start accessing them, you know, a little more cleverly. So here what we can say is um, results.dreamer mat file. And so that's where that value is stored. And now we can, you know, we, um, we uh, load it this way. So now we can add other arguments similarly. I probably won't do this for all of them because I wanna make sure there's time for questions. And at this point, it's really a matter of going through the rest of this function in particular um, and, uh, and, adding, um, and adding these for every input. Uh, Dreamer EEG CSV. But, uh, but yeah, so the idea is basically you provide everything that the user could provide, everything that could change from how you'd want to apply this on this data set to how you may want to apply it on a different data set in these types of arguments. And you ask the user for them up front, you can do validation on them. So for instance, say you wanted to, um, you know, have some threshold in your workflow. Um, you could have, uh, default be 0.4, you could have the type be a float, you can do all sorts of um, restrictions on this to make sure that people are providing the right type of data. Similarly, you could have, you know, multiple options. So for instance, um, one thing that I kind of showed you in my example on Wednesday, um, you could have, uh, um, you know, multiple choices. So you can say choices equals process store delete everything. Um, I hope you don't write that function. Um, but uh, whatever it may be, and then again, you can set default values and you can really like kind of restrict and help the user define um, what it actually is to, um, or how they can actually use your tool. So again, there's a lot of different, depending what argument parser library you're using, um, there's a lot of different ways to define these. Um, but the point is that you can also, you know, have optional arguments and so on and so forth, all sorts of things, but everything you may want from the user, every time there's a path to a file, for example, this should be provided here 
so that the user can specify it before running your tool. Um, I'll show you optional arguments in a second. Thanks, Danielle. Um, and, uh, and then what you do is basically go through your script and every time you're referencing them, for instance, here's another example of dreamer.mat that I just deleted on line 161. You replace it with the new variable name. So I'd recommend doing these, you know, one, one uh, variable at a time so you don't get lost. So again, we should probably have gone through and make sure everywhere we're using dreamer.mat, we replace that. Or I think the old variable is also called path. Um, so essentially, we, that's the process. And once this is done, it's much easier to write tests on things because then you can, again, say write a test for this function, you know, the one that starts here. Or you can uh, you, you know, write a test for the next function or, or the next one or so on and so forth and test all these things independently as well as remember the thing that I mentioned as well, uh, um, on, um, on Wednesday, not just unit tests, but integration tests, which is then using the actual like, driver script itself. Um, so uh, again, because just to answer Danielle's question, I'll quickly add a, um, an optional argument. Um, argument, and then um, I would love to open the floor for some questions for you guys, or from you guys. Um, and data points, or actually let's say, Danielle, can you give me an example name of an optional argument? My brain is just not working. Um, and that's just data points. I'll start with this. Um, ah, there we go. That is, look at me guessing correctly. Um, number of data points. So the way I just provided this actually um, is slightly different from the other um, parameters. Notice I provided it two different ways. Once with um, two dashes, and then the, this is the name that the, the variable will be stored as, and then a single thing with one dash. So that means on the command line, when I'm providing this value, I would, instead of just putting the number two or four or what have you, um, I would push put dash dash and underscore data points space then the number, or I could do dash n and the number. So this is just a shorthand for things that would go in this container. Um, but this one needs to exist because the variable needs to have a name. Um, so this is one that you can actually store, but you can also do things that are just binary. Um, uh, so you can, for instance, for, if say for some reason you wanted um, your tool to crash right away. Uh, I used the wrong, wrong quote. Um, action store true. And by the way, these should be in quotes. I was just sloppy. Um, so in this case, what uh, what will happen in the case of line 143 um, is if you provide the dash Q, it doesn't take any arguments. It'll just be a true or a false. And if you don't provide it, it'll be false. And if you do provide it, it'll be true. So that way you can not only just give values, but you can give, um, again, just Boolean state as well. So that's kind of the gist of how to turn these things into scripts. Um, and uh, yeah, so now basically I would just again love to um, open the floor for you guys to continue asking some questions if you have any about, you know, well, in my case, I have this particular use case, how would I use this and put this in a script? Or in my case, I would have this, how would I put this in a script? Um, and we can, uh, you know, Frankenstein them all onto here and hopefully it'll be a useful resource. Welcome, Ashraf. Um, can you show how to call functions in that script from another script? Absolutely. Um, great question. So one thing that, um, oh, by the way, I haven't committed this in a while. Um, I'm just going to quickly commit. Uh, almost done the lesson. The commit messages should be more useful than this. I'm just trying to get it there. Um, uh, there we go. Um, so uh, yeah, so one thing that I think Valerie mentioned yesterday when you're creating a Python library um, is using something like an init.py file. And what that essentially does is it tells Python that this directory can be interpreted as a module. Um, so without doing the init.py file, you wouldn't be able to import any functions in gregdemoscript.py. 
but because it's there, now you can. So what I could do is I could open a Python shell in this directory, and I could say from Greg demo script.py if it wants to. Oh, right, this won't tab complete. I'm, uh, script dot pi import driver. Um, I can't spell script. And actually, I don't need the dot pi. I'm being sloppy again. Um, so the same way that you would import a library in any other context, um, you do it here. Uh, in this case, it's because I'm able to do this because it's on the relative path. It's in my exact current location. Again, if you fully package your code, you can install it um, and, uh, and then do that from anywhere. But, uh, but this is just a way that you can import like local modules without them having to be packages if they're you know, in the same directory or, or nearby. Does that answer your question, Kendra? The suspense. I suspect more questions are coming. Um, oh, and by the way, you could, the same thing I did here from, you know, Greg demo script and board driver. Um, you could do that for any other function. I just didn't remember the names of any of the other functions uh, because they were long. Um, so, so yeah. go on. Oh, I'm just going to talk because my, I'm slow at typing, but I think where I usually get confused is when the, like the module is not in the same directory. Yeah. So in that case, what, if there's something that is really, you know, multi-purpose and you want to use it across other projects, the right thing to do is to probably make a package for it. And then you can just pip install it and use it from any directory. Um, if it's small enough that, you know, you want to use it in the same, just in the same package, but it's not really, or sorry, just in the same project, but not, it's not really package worthy, then I mean, it just kind of, it, it would be probably possible to just put it in the same place or nearby. Um, there's ways you can do different like referencing. If you Google specifically like import Python module relative path, um, you will get some useful things on how to do this. It's a bunch of like dots included in the way you import stuff. Um, because essentially in this uh, syntax, a dot more or less means a directory. Um, there's a bit of, there are a few exceptions to that, but that's more or less the gist. Um, but yeah, so for instance, if I go to a project of mine, um, this one. So in this directory, this is just a project of mine. I have a pipeline that pretty much does diffusion preprocessing using FSL. I have an init.py. I have something called preprocessing pipeline and I have something called fsl.py. And inside fsl.py, it basically just has all of the FSL functions I care about where pretty much it's going to create the command line from the arguments I passed to them. It's really doing nothing fancy. It's literally creating strings from me providing arguments in a slightly more Python-y way. Um, and I want to use this inside my preprocessing pipeline. So I just say import FSL. And because it's on the same relative path, it grabs it fine. Um, again, if this was a bigger library or something, like there were more functions or something like that, um, I could just create a package and then use it similarly. But again, in, in this case where it was small enough that I didn't want that, I just put it in the same place and that solved my problems. Um, cool. Well, if there are um, no more questions, then I guess um, we can call it. But uh, I'll push this up and I'll open a PR to their repo. In the content channel, um, I'll post a link to the slides and then in a thread on those slides, I'll put a, post a link to um, this file and, um, and then I'll upload my bash RC file that gives me pretty config stuff and a zip file that contains my like Vim configuration stuff too, in case people want that. If I forgot anything, please ping me. Um, and, uh, and I'll add it. But anyways, that'll all be in a thread on the content channel and feel free to ask questions there or to me directly. Um, better to ask them there because there's no such thing as a dumb question and I'm sure if you're thinking it so are others. So um, yeah, but um, also if you're too, you, you're shy or something like that, feel free to ask it to me and I may ask if I can repost the question there um, anonymously or something like that. Cool. Well then, uh, thanks very much. Uh, sorry, thanks very much everyone and um, I will see you a little later.